Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Susanna Pollock. I'm president of Games for Change. If you don't know us yet, Games for Change is a not for profit that supports game creators and social innovators to drive real world impact using digital games. Um, we're really pleased to invite you uh, to join our live industry circle Q&A with Playmatix, a member of our 2016 industry circle. Today we have CEO Margaret Wallace and Chief Creative Officer Nick Fortugno. Both are amazing game designers and they're going to talk about their work and answer some of your burning questions. Um, we're going to be uh, running the Q&A both uh, through the YouTube chat tool on the upper right hand corner of your screen and Twitter, and if you can use the hashtag G4C industry, um, that would be great. So please start thinking about your questions. Okay, so the Games for Change Industry Circle is now in its second year. Um, this initiative highlights companies and entrepreneurs emerging as leaders in the impact games sector. Uh, by sharing their methods and best practices and lessons learned, we hope to inspire others in our growing community. The 2016 Industry Circle also includes Brain Pop, Filament Games, and Shell Games, all of whom you'll hear from later, uh, well, in the next year. Um, so a little bit about Playmatics first, and then I'll pass it over to Margaret. Uh, Playmatics was founded in 2009 and is based in Brooklyn. They specialize in creating digital and real-world interactive games and experiences. Playmatics has collaborated with some great partners, including PBS, AMC, the NSF, the New York Public Library, and many others to create unique experiences ranging from web games to museum installations. We are so excited to have you here today, Margaret and Nick. Um, I'm going to first pass this over to Margaret, who's going to say some words, and then I think Nick is going to join in. Hey there, Susanna. Thank you so much for that great introduction, and thanks to Games for Change for giving Playmatics the opportunity to chat with you guys more about what we do, and, and, and hello to the audience as well. Uh, thank you for giving the, the overview that you did for Playmatics, and you know, one thing that Nick and I are really proud of is that uh, Playmatics is a New York-based, specifically a Brooklyn-based company, and we've been around for a lot of years, and we've seen a lot of game companies come and go in that time, and we feel very fortunate that we can represent New York City and also, in my case, uh, San Francisco uh, for what we what we do and what we focus on. And the, re the way Playmatics was formed, Nick and I have been involved in the game industry for, for a really long time, uh, mostly in the world of uh, games specifically for entertainment, and whether you're talking about online or mobile, uh, casual games, uh, also uh, non-digital games, and we love that space, but what we found over the past few years is that the world of games has been infiltrating so many different corners of, of different industries, and we it's enabled us to really expand our focus to work a lot with filmmakers, people who are into transmedia, and also increasingly so, and that's why we're here today, around uh, science games and games that have some kind of healthcare intervention component. And I know Nick wanted to speak a little bit about uh, how we approach that kind of, of project or product. It's not the same as creating games that are specifically for entertainment or monetization or marketing purposes, but there is a lot of overlap. And so uh, we thought it'd be cool to come together today with you guys and talk about that. Nick, did you want to add anything to that introduction? Uh, no, just only to say that, um, you know, it's just super exciting to be here with Games for Change because Games for Change has been such a sort of an excellent partner in advocating for the role of games in different fields like education and science and healthcare. And that, you know, we really see our our role as a company has been very significant in terms of producing games for those fields. And we're excited about the opportunity to do more of that work. So we're just happy to be here and be part of this conversation. Also, I'll say, you know, something that we have um, you know, pride ourselves with in terms of wh what we focus on as a company, and I think it's something that's contributed to our ability to hang in there and also build a, a business, is, uh, you know, we try not to just 
uh, be innovative on the product level to whatever extent we can and create interesting strategic partnerships and look for cool opportunities. But we also try to, uh, and this is a message I want to send to the audience, we also try to um, put our best foot forward in terms of positioning the company to have long-term benefits with whatever we work on and with whatever we're part of. And that's so important for small businesses to uh, keep in mind when, when um, they're pursuing projects or partnerships because it's really enabled us to sort of uh, hang in there and also really diversify what we get to focus on. All right. Um, great. Thank you so much. So now we'd like to start our uh, Q and A session. Um, so Margaret, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about. So I'm Sarah from Games for Change, a senior director of programs here, and I'll be moderating the, uh, the question and answer session. So just a reminder to our live viewers, you can enter in your questions in the top right window um, uh, next to the, the YouTube broadcast. You can also enter in your questions on Twitter um, using hashtag G4C industry. And we will be monitoring both places. Um, and uh, feel free to ask your burning questions to Margaret and Nick for the next um, 20 or 30 minutes. So um, so would love to hear from both of you. Um, maybe start with you, Margaret, about how you actually developed the five-step uh, framework that you included in the Games for Change newsletter. Well, one thing that's been really interesting about Playmatics, and uh, Nick, Nick and I have d uh, run startups together, and we've both worked on, at lots of other companies, and I've worked at large companies and, sm and smaller companies. And, uh, you know, one thing that Playmatics presents as presented as a specific challenge, but it's been really interesting, is no two... Uh, things that we focus on are really alike. I mean, in some ways, Nick likes to use the word bespoke company. And I think in, in some ways it's true in terms of how we pick and choose projects. And Playmatics, it's never the same thing twice. So it, it creates, it requires a lot of uh, dexterity in terms of being able to sort of grok a, a problem, figure out where we can contribute and how we can potentially create things that are hugely profitable or hugely impactful. And that's exactly how we ended up working a lot in the science and healthcare industry. Nick has a pretty extensive background in educational games, and maybe Nick, you should speak to that. But really, it was just getting out there, meeting people, talking, of, talking to people, keeping um, a, a finger on the pulse of sort of where we feel like trends are heading and, and where our world is heading. I mean, uh, with automation and robots, robotics and the changing landscape of our population and, and healthcare and education. We just uh, got out there, spoke to a lot of people. I know, Nick, uh, you were at the White House a couple years ago uh, for some kind of event. Did you want to pick up on that at all? Yeah, I mean, I've I've had a background working in educational games for about 12 years at this point. Um, and 12 years ago was really early. You know, that was that was like very early experimentation before the sort of rise of, you know, like like gamification through education more generally and an understanding of metrics in games in a more sophisticated way. We were doing stuff back in the early days, games like IET, the cost of life that we did with global kids at a company called Game Lab many years ago. Um, yeah, and, and the and the tips that are that we're mentioning in the framework. Um, come out of like, you know, doing this kind of practice over a variety of projects. And since all the projects have been different, it's been really useful for us to see what we could universalize about those projects in terms of like, you know, what are the steps that we come to that to make these things make sense. And the reason why we use this framework is because as as Margaret suggested, it's very different to make uh, a game experience for a, a goal that isn't simply entertainment. Like when you have a health efficacy goal or you have a scientific research goal or you have, you know, in parallel an educational goal or a political influence goal, um, you're not just trying to be fun, although you have to be fun. You're trying to do something else at the same time. And usually that's something, and this gets to the core principles of the framework, A, you don't know much about when you walk in the door, B, there's someone there who knows much more about in terms of both what will count as efficacy and how do you get there, 
And C, you're working with people who often don't have experience making games before. So they actually don't know the vagaries of the game design process. And those things lead to uh, potential confusions and miscommunications and misunderstandings that can trouble a project. And so we have learned how to navigate those things. And we could actually have a, a whole schema about how we work that that's designed to like you know, be the most efficient and most effective way to produce that kind of work. And I think it's something that's really useful for game designers to know when they enter into that space, because it, there are ways these things can go very wrong. Um, and there are certainly ways that you can fail, even if they don't go wrong, in subtle ways around like not being fun enough or not being efficacious enough, because you're just not balancing those things properly. And so really what we were hoping to offer was sort of an understanding of how we think about the relationship between like a subject matter expert and a game designer when you enter into a kind of working relationship around uh, Game for Impact. And, and also, uh, that was great, Nick. And also, just to tag on to what was just said, you know, as one of our points in the, the, the framework, the so-called framework that we put together is, you know, everybody respects each other's expertise. And you know, one thing we are expected and we're happy to be able to bring to the table besides design thinking is is some understanding of commercialization and productization and how one gets something into the marketplace. So the so the challenges are are there along the way from inception, from when you start collaborating together, how do you take research goals or healthcare interventions and how do you uh, turn those into um, actionable items and products? And then from there, what do you do with it? Do you, do you sell it like an app? Do you put it in the app store? Do you work with um, insurance companies? Uh, it's just, it's a whole new world. It's exciting. It's complicated. And you know, working with healthcare professionals or scientists, uh, it's just been a great opportunity to to really make build a lot of bridges too. Great, thank you. Can you guys talk a little bit about the Science Game Lab um, and uh, and maybe how um, what types of researchers you've worked with and how you actually either identify and actually find scientists to collaborate with, or or maybe how they find you. Well, in this case, uh, the Science Game Lab is a partnership that Playmatics has established with the Scripps Research Institute, and specifically with Dr. Benjamin Good, who uh, is is sta headed stationed over there. And Nick, you first met Ben, Dr. Good, at an NIH event. Is that correct? National Institute of Health. Yeah, the NIH had a think tank uh, to think about games for research, um, which is a which is an interesting difference, and I think it's it's worth it to just to speak like. 30 seconds on. These aren't meant to be games that are designed to teach people about science, although they might. These are games that are meant to actually be research actions. Um, and if you know the game Fold It, that's a good example of this, where like the engagement with the game is a way to uh, experiment effectively in the, in the world with real data. And then those experiments can produce results that scientists can use or that can go forward into certain kinds of engineering or certain kinds of publication. So the whole workshop was sort of about that. And then after that, Ben contacted Playmatics about like thinking about how a lot of the games that had already been made in that space by scientists would then you know, like could could be aggregated into something that could be a more powerful experience that could share audiences and you know create further like like more research, more engagement all throughout. And and so this collaboration has been really eye opening. So uh, we got together with Scripps to create what is now a web games channel, and eventually we hope to move it to mobile. And because Ben, ident Dr. Good, identified this issue where there are all of these citizen science games and activities. And citizen science, as I'm sure you all know and the audience knows, uh, and as Nick just implied, it's research-driven um, games and activities. So they're not just there's not just an educational component, um, but a lot of these games are sort of these discrete one-off experiences. And so uh, we were working with Scripps to put together a, a portal that has all of these amazing tools, these APIs for developers and scientists and research to use to plug their games into our infrastructure. And this has all sorts of implications, not only for creating centralized user identities for citizen scientists from around the world, but also opportunities for us to work directly with scientists from all around the world. So one um, organization we work with is a university 
uh, of California at San Francisco, uh, the, there's a project called Wiki Pathways where, um, you know, one of the challenges in scientists with scientists right now is just the sheer nature sheer uh, proliferation of research and, and things that need to be cataloged and categorized and organized. And so that's one area of um, citizen science that Wikipathways focuses on. Anyway, so Science Game Lab has, um, it's, we're in the process of onboarding developers now. It's, uh, it has a, a universal profile. You can share registration IDs. There are leaderboards and badges, you know, the typical thing. But there's also a pretty interesting tagging structure that we're also developing. It's It's been really exciting to meet scientists uh, who work on, um, you know, marine biology or biodiversity, all coming together under the, the name and umbrella of citizen science. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, so Nick, we have a question from Andy Varsheen. Uh, how do you balance educating players versus educating uh, versus engaging gameplay so that the games are both educational and fun? So the, the, the basic idea behind creating sort of engaging uh, engaging educational games or engaging games about efficacy is that like if you if you if you treat those two things as if they're separate and you basically say I need to make a fun game and I need to teach someone fractions or I need to make a fun game and I need to get them to stop smoking, then you will not succeed because you'll think about those things as separate and you'll try to like merge them together because you'll think that the fun game has nothing to do with the smoking cessation or the fun game has nothing to do with the fractions and then things feel tacked on and broken. Um, the way that you get both of them at the same time is to see that like, if you're gonna use a game for impact in some way, the impact has to be the gameplay. That's just how the medium works. It's like, I don't make a movie, a documentary movie where I try to teach you about a topic and then flash huge paragraphs of text in the middle of the movie. Like the methods of the movie have to teach the lesson or else it doesn't work. And so the method of gameplay is play. You have to play the object. And so if you want to teach someone something or you want to get them to change behavior, what you need to do is make the interactions of the game about the thing you're trying to teach or about the behavior you're trying to change. You just tie them directly to each other. And so the process is less like, hey, what's a fun game? And then how do I stuff fractions into it? It's more, what is fraction learning? And how do you use fractions in the world? And like, what are the problems people have with fractions? And then how do I make those things fun? Like, how do I take the problems that fractions have and then make them interesting so that, like, you want to do them over and over again? And that process really comes out of a methodology that we talk about in our points, which is um, you, you really have to start by understanding the material. And that usually takes place in our in our work with what we call a seminar where we don't do any game design at the very beginning of the process. All we're trying to do is just learn about the topic. But what we do as game designers, as we, as we hear from the subject matter experts, is we think about where are the moments where someone could interact with this material? Like where are the points where decision making could be valuable or where I feel like I could get rewarded? And then how can I tease that out in a way that I can make a fun game? And that, like, that process leads you to a game that's just naturally about the content. So you never really have to worry that much that you're going way off track because it's all born out of the content material. Now that said, we very much encourage, and this is also a point in our five points, that you stay related to the subject matter experts in every part of the process and that the testing be kind of constant back and forth because you as the game designer probably just don't know enough about fractions or smoking cessation or, you know, like like researching tags for journal articles so scientists can find article fasters to, to make all the right decisions in the game design. So if you keep the subject matter experts involved in the testing and you can educate them a little bit on your language of game design, then you can actually have a really good conversation where you stay on course. I'm not going to lie and say there aren't tensions here, right? Like when you make games for fun, it's very easy to just like throw out anything that's not fun and replace it with something else. And if you make an educational game and fractions aren't fun, you know, you can't throw out fractions. <laughs> you can't suddenly make it okay for people to smoke because the stopping smoking isn't fun. Uh, so that's the challenging part of the equation. But if you start from the content and you apply the game design to the content, at least then you know that the game's gonna hit its targets and then you can concentrate on what you're good at, which is making something fun. 
Do you mind if I just quickly follow up on uh, that, Nick, and tell me what you think? To Nick's point about the, the tension that exists sometimes that's necessary between intervention goals, whether it's healthcare or educational or scientific, versus the fun factor, there were times that uh, that if you focus on the education or the design uh, in the wrong way, and Nick, maybe you can speak to this, it, it can uh, create a dishonest uh, intervention because you know you're almost sort of gaming, almost gaming what uh, the user is going to experience, and you're not necessarily testing what you think you're testing or uh, or or having users respond to the things that you really want to draw their attention to in that moment to moment interaction. Um, I'm thinking, Nick, a lot of the work that we've done around uh, focus training touches on that uh, a lot. Yeah, and I, and I think that, and especially in games for research, which is what Science Game Lab is focused on, you know, like if you're really, really, really trying to just get testing results out of something, which is a very different way to make a game, then it's critical that you don't influence them. Because if you throw that off, then the testing results are just worthless. Uh, so you got to be pretty careful about that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so we'd love to hear you talk about the challenge of multiple product launches. Um, this was the, the fourth point in your five-point framework, um, the, the challenges of planning for multiple product launches, um, if the game's intended for a laboratory or a major commercial release, um, and how to um, sort of plan for, for that. Um, so it, we'd love for you to give sort of an example or a case study from your work. Okay, so I'll start off and then Nick definitely let's tag team this one because I think we both have a lot to say about this. This is one of those points that I wish I could say we intuitively knew we were going to encounter stepping into working with games of focus on health and science. I mean, um, so in some ways, depending on how research driven the, the the game experience is, uh, the, the development in the game never ends and the research never ends, right? And it's an ongoing, um, ongoing thing. And, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of, Nick, can you think of a recent example that you want to bring up around that uh, that might be relevant? Yeah, so I think that there's a couple of there's a couple of dimensions to this that I think are are useful. One is like the context of of delivery, right? In terms of like what is what is the audience you're going to deliver this to? And there's like and a lot of times with games around health and games around uh, science, you end up going through testing procedures that are formal processes. It's not like testing for games. It's like a very different thing that science or healthcare understand, and they have very different ways of understanding those things. Um, and so delivering for that audience is actually quite different than delivering for a real audience. Like one simple example is that once a test starts in a scientific setting, your ability to modify things based on the results of the test are very limited. And so you can't go through a normal service model with games where you're just like, oh, this is broken and I guess I'll just change it or we'll A-B test it and then we'll see which one works. Like that's not possible because like once the game goes in, it's locked. You can't change it. It invalidates the results. And that's much more sophisticated than I just said it was. So you need to talk to the scientists to figure that out. I mean, and the second issue that comes up is that you know, when you think about the differences between those stages of like a sort of testing, testing into a formal testing setting, the informal testing you're doing, and then a commercial release, then the needs of the product are actually different. And so the, the, the timeline you think about the project on has to take that into consideration. Like, there's a lot of stuff in monetization that you really just don't need in formal testing. And if you're on a deadline on a grant, you have to kind of think about what the relationship is going to look like in terms of when that stuff's going to get done. Because if you emphasize that stuff too early in the process, then you're actually losing time towards the test to do other things. So one of the things that we've learned to do very early in our relationships is sort of establish a set of milestones with the subject matter experts that just determine like, okay, well, where are we testing this at what points? And so, and what do we need at those points? Because once you get into the platform side of it, that's a whole other issue around, do I actually need an iPhone build for the, for the test? Maybe I can just push this on Android for the test. Do I need to support multiple platforms of mobile for this test? Like, actually, maybe we can just hand everybody a tablet. So, like, those kind of questions become, like, really influential over a development process. I mean, the reality of this is that 
games for science and healthcare come in hugely different sizes in terms of how they work. And depending on which partners you're working with and where their funding comes from, the game could be actually very, very small or gigantic. It, and, it, and a lot of it is sort of based on the, on the, the expectations of the field. So there are different parts of funding structures that just sort of expect higher budgets than others. And so when you're looking at that kind of stuff, you have to lead the conversation about development with the client. And you would think, you would absolutely think that people who are like running grants and like looking at the, the deadlines of grants, looking at the deadlines of testing would be the ones to own the idea of like, okay, well, when does some certain things have to get done? But people who aren't familiar with development processes can't think in terms of development processes. So it's really incumbent on you to help the client understand like, okay, if you're, we're partnering with you to get to this test, what is the date of the test? Where is the test going to be? Who is it going to be for? What kind of equipment are they going to have? What are the key features we're going to need to have to test what we're testing? How long after this do we think a commercial release is going to happen? And when do we need to start preparing for that? Those are all things that are incumbent on, I think, the game development company to, to, to really lead because they're the, we're the people who know more about how that stuff works. And I can't, I can't emphasize enough how important it is as a business owner to have those those factors clear. So there are huge implications in terms of the product, in terms of the research, in terms of the game experience, but also in terms of budget, future upside. Like, uh, you know, it, when you run a business, you know, one little decision you make up front, where even where you think you have all of the uh, factors, uh, um, you know, considered, um, one little mistake can have huge implications. And so uh, if, if uh, a small business owner or a game developer is approached by scientists and, and um, you know, they have a certain amount of, of budget and they weren't, want you involved in certain ways in terms of upside uh, and, and yet they want, you know, five different product lines based out of this one um, amount. And not only does the um, game have to be ready for clinical trials, it also needs to simultaneously be ready for a commercial release. And it also needs to have all of the monetization and e-commerce figured out and integrated, and also the launch plan integrated and the commercialization plan. I mean, that's a that's a very drastically different landscape. And I think there's, it's always incumbent upon Playmatics to make sure that we work with our partners to really um, drive what that could look like and to make sure that Playmatics is protected and also that our interests are aligned for any future upside because it's not serving anyone if you know we all go into something together thinking one size will fit all uh, because if you spend all of your time you know fixing uh, user on ramp and social net media integration uh, and less on uh, you know what you need to study for a clinical trial for example if you're not going to succeed it with either unless you you know you have 50 million dollars and then sure go go at it have a good time but that often isn't the reality and that's fine because we believe that there's such huge upside if you look at the the, the metrics for the healthcare industry right now and compare that to the games industry, like there's such a, a market opportunity there for people who, who make games and digital products and also real world experiences that tap into these different industry sectors. That's great, thank you. Um, and while we're on the subject of Games for Health, um, just a quick shout out to the Games for Change Festival um, coming up this summer we'll have a track on health, games, and uh, neuroscience. So hopefully all of you who have tuned in will be joining us uh, this summer for our 14th annual festival. Um, so another question, um, we all love stories of failure. So would love to hear if you have a good um, story from a failed project or, um, or you know, um, game, from your past that you could share. Um, doesn't have to be super specific, but um, ideally that ties to one of the points in your framework. Yeah, so I can I can talk specifically about uh, or like, like in abstract, but about a specific case in the in in the in these thing in in the in the pullets that kind of led to these kind of decisions. So in some of our early work with scientists, and this was a long time ago, uh, we we initiated a relationship in a in a in a in a, in a multi phased uh, grant structure, right? So it had like a bunch of deadlines that had to be met and there were triggers on those deadlines that kind of move things forward. 
And when we met with the with the with the researchers we were working with, um, they understood that schedule. So we just sort of we were like, okay, great, you've got the schedule. So we're going to start working, and we laid out a plan for what we were going to do. And our understanding was that they own the schedule. So, you know, it's their grant. They don't get any money if this thing doesn't happen. So we just sort of had a trust that like, oh, they're going to let us know when things are happening. And they're going to like, let us let us know if there's anything dire. And we're going to work on the game. So we went into the game development. We got very deep into it. And as we went into the game development, the researchers started to see the possibilities of the game. And they started to encourage us to make changes. And this is very normal in these processes. And because we felt like they were aware of the deadlines on the project, we entertained that stuff. Because we were like, well, if there's a problem with this, they'll tell us. And we would be very transparent, like, oh, this thing's going to take an extra three weeks. This thing's going to take an extra two weeks. And they were just like, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, that sounds great. And we looked at the schedule, and it didn't make sense. But they had approved it. So we basically were like, OK, well, I guess the deadline's going to slide, because otherwise this wouldn't make any sense. And they know the deadlines. So we continued with that process, you know, like try to refining it towards a vision that we were trying to share. And then near the point of the first deadline, you know, really like a matter of days before the deadline, we got a panicked email from the researchers basically saying, how are we ever going to hit this deadline from where we are? And we were shocked because we were like, you are the one who made this deadline. You knew this deadline the entire time. Like, we kept telling you how everything was changing. How on earth did you not see this? And we realized like, oh, they weren't adding this up. They they don't think this way. Like we as the developer were thinking about how all these things added up and stacked and, and reached a deadline. They were kind of just thinking about what they could do. And they were sort of spinning it on that loop. And we realized that like, we needed to be in, like in, like we really needed to hold on to that because what ended up happening is we ended up having to scramble to sort of meet a deadline um, with a product that we weren't all super satisfied with, basically because the the shared understanding of what a schedule was didn't really make sense. And that taught us, like, from that point on to really take ownership over those things. Like, it, it's just a super critical issue that comes up around really, I think, two things. It's fluency and development expectations, right? Like development expectations are what I just talked about. Like, what does it mean to have a deadline? What does it mean to hit a deadline? Because these things are different in research. Um, the second thing is is fluency. Like, what does it mean when we say alpha and beta? What does it mean when a scientist says uh, proven? What does it mean when when we talk about efficacy in a health field? Like, what is the percentage of efficacy that's actually meaningful? Like, those are things that two sides just don't know. And if they don't communicate them early on, then there can be a lot of confusion down the line. Where like like a, what a deadline meant for starting a test for us clearly was different than what a deadline meant for the scientists in terms of the relative importance, their presence of mind about it, and the expectations of the product. And if we had just sat down at the beginning and kind of come to a shared understanding, we wouldn't have been scrambling at the end. And that's something that we now implement in every project we do. Great. That's super helpful. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so we're about to close out. So I want to ask the, the audience that's tuned in, um, please enter in any final questions um, to the YouTube chat window or on Twitter, hashtag G4C industry. Um, two final questions. We'd love to hear what games you're currently playing right now, if there's anything that's, that you'd recommend out to our audience. Um, and then finally, just a, a, a tip or a trick from the trade to end on for the developers that have tuned in. So maybe Margaret, you want to go first? Yeah. So games, gosh, uh, I I try to play everything uh, right now. Uh, I'm always a huge fan of, of Hearthstone. I have to tell you, sometimes I'll I'll still go back and play uh, Plants vs Zombies or Alpha Bear, so casual games. Uh, I've been a, I've had a hankering. Uh, to get back more into some uh, hardcore role-playing games uh, that require a lot of investment of time. I've been really wanting to do that, but I just don't have the, the time to do that, unfortunately. So I guess those are the things that I'm really into right now. Uh, I've been playing uh, Pandemic Legacy a lot. <laughs> I'm really fascinated by uh, Davio's design ideas around legacy games, and I've, I've been researching them for, for stuff like that. Uh, I'm playing Fallout 4 at home because I, I teach, and the semester's just ending, so I can finally get back into hardcore games. So I've got that, and then Alien Isolation, and then um, 
And then I'm gonna try Final Fantasy 15 because it's supposed to be for beginners, and like I, I don't believe it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try uh, just to see how that goes. Um, on the you know you know, and then and in terms of final tips, I mean, and, and that should be just a sign, right? Like I think it's useful to say that. Maybe that's a good tip. Is it like? You know, I, I've always been a, someone arguing back when we called these things serious games. And then, you know, like in the early days that like, I really hate us distinguishing these things. Like I learn a ton from playing Fallout 4 that I use in educational game design all the time. I, I you know, the designs of some of the health stuff we're working on now are drawn directly from inspiration from the kinds of casual games Margaret was talking about. So like that, that relationship is I think strong, and I just I, I'm very heartened by the fact that that nothing that's happened with Games for Change or with the Games for Impact movement has started to push people away from the broader games community. That we still see ourselves as part of the broader games community, which I think is I think is a terrific thing. I guess the final tip that I have from from um, from this the, this list is I want to just reemphasize like the, the second point we make because I think it's really the most valuable and important point. And if you understand that, then everything else makes sense. Is that like when you work in partnership with people, just respect their expertise, right? You are good at game development if you're a game developer. Um, and the client partner relationship you're with, the subject matter expert, is not. The partner is probably really good at something you're not good at and you don't understand it. Like, and you shouldn't kid yourself that you understand it if you casually understand it because people who spent 20 years researching the thing that you think you know, know more about it than you do. So having an open mind as you approach these things where you both respect each other's um, expertise is really great. And the best way you can do that as a game developer is to model it. Just show them that you respect what they think and show them that you're listening and show them that you try to understand their language. And like I, the, the biggest thing that I do, I think, to help in these relationships is I try to learn the language of the subject matter expert so that I can speak their language. And that's like a large part of what these development processes are. So if I get to the end of a project around smoking cessation, I want to be able to talk about the psychology of smoking cessation somewhat fluently. I'm not going to know it. I'm never going to be an expert on it, but I can at least speak their language. And that tells them that I'm listening and that they that, that we were on the same page and that I respect them. And I think that like if we can enter into that kind of relationship, and I, and I guess this is just in the state of the game industry right now, I just feel like this is super important to say where we like respect our partners, we respect our audience, like we're not trying to scam anybody or do anything that's manipulative. We're we're all in this together trying to make an interesting experience that's gonna make change, like do social good. So we don't have to talk down to anybody and we don't have to act like we're superior. We know our stuff, they know their stuff. And, and at the same time, a, a final tip would be, you know, and this is a message to anyone who is is out there who this might be relevant to is, you know, it, it affects all of us um, when people don't know the value they, they bring to the table. And that goes for the research partners, the healthcare professionals, but that also goes for the game creators and the small business owners and the startups, because not knowing your value um, gets you into all sorts of trouble, um, both in terms of hubris, potential hubris or potential risk, but also in terms of you know, um, just making bad deals and setting industry standards that are bad for all of us. So I always say that one bad deal um, from a, comp a complimentary company or startup, that impacts all of us. We've seen that happen uh, in, in our uh, time in the game industry in, in different areas where, you know, you see a lot of bad bets made or a lot of desperate deals made or, or deals entered into where people don't know what they're bringing to the table or the value isn't clear or nebulous or it's, or it's misjudged. And that affects all of us, right? So it's incumbent upon anyone who is entering into these, these partnerships, because as you guys can hear, you know, there's there's a lot expected of Playmatics in terms of what we bring to the table in terms of expertise around commercialization, fundraising. I mean, that's something we haven't touched on, but we we have a lot of experience with, with fundraising and financing know-how. And that's not uh, that's not lacking value. And so all of us who 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 are in this together have to elevate the industry by protecting ourselves and and um, aligning everyone's interests so that uh, we all are in business in a few years to keep um, keep contributing to what I think is potentially very revolutionary as far as games um, impact with healthcare and science. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Margaret and Nick. Um,
for the sound advice and, uh, and all the words of wisdom. Um, if you want to learn more, check out um, the blog post um, with these with the five point framework uh, from Playmatics on gamesforchange.org slash blog. And you can read more about our industry circle program at gamesforchange.org slash industry hyphen circle. Um, really great. Thank you for tuning in. Hope everybody has a warm and respectful holiday. And we will see you in the new year. Thank you so much. Playmatics. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.